My name is uh, Manny Capsalis. I'm a judge in the Fairfax County General District Court, and with particular pride, I will also tell you that I'm a, a member of the Board of Directors of Lawyers Helping Lawyers. Uh, I had the privilege of being appointed to that uh, board back in 2002 by the uh, then president of the Virginia State Bar, Ben DeMuro. Thrilled to see Ben here today. And part of what sustained me uh, as I went through my uh, terms as an attorney on the board uh, was uh, in a speech that I would hear president of the bar a couple years before that Joe Kondo give that I believe was entitled The Law is a Jealous Mistress. Uh, and, it, and it's something that really resonates uh, in what we're dealing with today. I, after rotating off the board of lawyers helping lawyers, I was able to, uh, again, go back on the board this time as a sitting judge. Uh, it is my great pleasure today to introduce the moderator of the next uh, panel. Uh, and I was given a, a short biography of the moderator, Justice Mims. I will exercise, if I may, a bit of uh, judicial prerogative and, uh, and a short <laughs> prerogative uh, and add a, an addendum uh, to the end of the biography. Justice Mims uh, became a uh, member of the Supreme Court of Virginia in 2010. From 1992 to 2010, he served as a member of the Virginia House of Delegates in the State Senate uh, as Chief Deputy Attorney General and, of course, as Attorney General of our Commonwealth. Grew up in Harrisonburg, went to public schools in Harrisonburg, received a degree in history from the College of William & Mary, where he did graduate work, <coughs> has law degrees from GW and from Georgetown. During his years in the General Assembly, he worked uh, as an attorney in Leesburg, as a die for a while. I'm thrilled to see a fellow Leesburgian, if that's the proper term, uh, here today. Uh, he also uh, served as Chief of Staff to uh, then Congressman Wolf and uh, Deputy Legislative Director to Senator Tribble. He's an adjunct uh, pr uh, professor, distinguished adjunct professor of law, George Mason, my alma mater. Uh, he was from 2002 to 2005 serves as an elder of his church, and is on the board of the John Marshall Foundation. Now for the addendum. On the heels of the ABA study and the National Wellness Task Force, which our Chief Justice served, uh, and on the heels of the resolution of the Conference of Chief Justices, uh, our Chief returned to the Commonwealth and issued a challenge to our legal profession and to our judiciary. It was to confront a crisis, but it was a crisis that was and is hiding in plain sight. It took the vision of our chief to begin us to be able to confront this crisis that's hiding in plain sight. And part of what he did was to appoint a, someone who could chair a committee what eventually became the Committee on Lawyer Wellbeing of the Supreme Court that consisted of 24 members of our judiciary and our legal profession. I'm very, very honored to be one of those members, and I see several other members of that uh, Supreme Court <coughs> Committee. But that was the beginning of it. The second thing was, well, how do you confront that crisis? You form a committee, but what are you going to do with that committee? You need someone with vision to chair that committee, someone willing to do the hard work, someone with the gravitas, someone with the determination, someone who is willing and able and has proven himself to be able to roll up his sleeves and to get to work. That, my friends, is Justice Mims. It is a particular privilege to be able to introduce someone and to be able to work with that person who clearly believes that public service is both noble and necessary, and that is Justice Mims. And the report of that committee is wonderful and really is the framework for what has gone out, what brings us here today before the General Assembly, to the law schools, to everywhere, uh, and is, I think, the beginning of perhaps a belated but a wonderful focus on this problem. Uh, and today, 
Justice Mims is going to moderate this panel discussion of our law school deans and representatives from our law schools. So without uh, further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce the distinguished chair of the Supreme Court's Committee on Lori Will Bing, the Honorable Justice William C. Mims. Thank you, and uh, that committee was extraordinary. Uh, for those of you who, are mi many or most of the members of that committee are here in this room, but it did remarkable work, and uh, and it's the 24 members of the committee that get the uh, that get the credit for uh, for the product that we have and the the many 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 recommendations. We've got a couple of hard copies of this outside, but you can also find it uh, on the Supreme Court's website. Um, Justin, uh, uh, Justin was here up until a moment ago. Oh well, Justin, thank you to Justin's chair. Um, wonderful book. Uh, I want you to uh, to get Justin's book, The Common Rule. Um, I uh, um, I was going to say that I am reading it every morning instead of going onto my um, uh, onto my um, iPhone, but um, Justin said I have to read someone who's dead. <laughs> and so, uh, so I'm going to find something else to read first, but then uh, I've been uh, working my way through it, and I uh, really encourage you. Um, you know, Manny's right. There, there is a crisis, and I've learned through my years in the, leg in the legislature and at the Office of the Attorney General that often it takes a terrible tragedy for the public, um, public bodies to deal with a crisis. Um, I, uh, I was, uh, uh, my legislation many years ago reformed teen driving uh, laws and it could that could only pass because a large number of teenagers had been killed in car crashes the year before. I worked on um, Chief, Justice, Chief Justice Hassell's Mental Health Reform Commission and our recommendations could only have gotten through to the extent they did because of the terrible tragedy at Virginia Tech. This is unusual to actually have a crisis that is hiding in plain sight, as you mentioned, and have this kind of a reaction, this kind of, this kind of action, without there being some sort of a very high profile uh, tragedy that was attached to it. And in, in large measure, it's because the Chief Justice um, uh, simply said, it will be so. Um, on the court, we know the Chief Justice is God. And, uh, and, and he spoke this into being, and uh, look what happened, and, uh, and it was good. So, uh, <laughs> like it was, like, just like on the sixth day, it was very good. So, so thank you, thank you very much. Um, four of the members of our commission um, were law school deans, and, uh, and their part of the report, which I would commend to you, um, really is extraordinary. Uh, that part was, uh, was chaired by Catherine, and thank you for doing so. Um, it deals with both the Virginia Board of Bar Examiners and the law schools, but during this panel we will focus really only on the law school aspects of it since, um, since Catherine did such a good job of talking about the Board of Bar Examiners. What I want to do is to introduce um, each, I'll introduce each of the deans and then ask each one to, um, to speak. Um, for roughly five to eight minutes about what you are doing at your law school. And I may have a prompt or two or a question or two, but hopefully by the time we finish with all eight, there will be time left because I'd love for the students at this point to, uh, to give feedback, to ask questions, uh, to really participate as well. So I'm going to begin with Dave Douglas from William & Mary, uh, again, a member of the, uh, of the committee. And um, rather than going through a full biography, I will say if you go to his Wikipedia page, you will see that he, um, come, he pops up as author. And when you uh, read through it fully, you will understand why. Um, in particular, he is an expert on civil rights law and, uh, and someone who is passionate about that. Dean Golubov also is an expert on civil rights law. And uh, at this particular time, I think having uh, these two deans um, uh, really in the forefront in our Commonwealth is so critically important. 
Um, I would point out that um, Dean Douglas um, has a PhD from Yale, uh, a JD from Yale, a Master of Divinity from Yale, and a bachelor's degree from? No, Princeton. <laughs> which may explain some of which, some, some, a little bit of why Taylor Reevely um, told me probably 20 years ago that he was just the most extraordinary professor and uh, was going to be the most extraordinary dean, and Taylor Reevely was correct. So um, I would now ask um, you to come forward. Actually, you can stay there or come forward, whichever you prefer. But in particular, with regard to William and Mary, if you could talk about Wellness Wednesdays okay. and also what you're doing with veterans, which I think is so important. Okay. Well, Justice Mims, thank you so much, and thank you for your leadership. Uh, I will say, uh, for the deans who were here, this is an incredibly important day for us. And it means so much to look out into this audience and to see everyone who's here and everyone who deeply cares about this issue, because we deeply care about this issue and we're deeply engaged with it. So thank you uh, for your leadership and I'm delighted to be here. You asked about Wellness Wednesdays. Let me just backtrack uh, by saying a few years ago, we were really thinking a lot about uh, the wellness of our students and a lot of the programming that we were doing was in the orientation week. Uh, that seemed to make sense. We're orienting students to law school, so we did a lot of activities around wellness in that orientation week. And that was fine, but then we realized, you know what, that's really probably not the right way to do this because that's, you're all excited about orientation week, but then it kind of drifts off. And so we said, we need to have this be a regular feature of the law school. So a couple of years ago, we started something called Wellness Wednesdays. And what that means is every Wednesday at the noon hour, we have some kind of programming around wellness. Now, what is that? It's everything from having a speaker who comes in and, and, and talks about dealing with stress or sleep, as someone has mentioned a few times, that's a big issue for me. Um, or uh, some activities, uh, teaching uh, meditation, teaching Tai Chi or yoga, or a group of people taking a walk over to the Colonial Williamsburg. So, but hit it every week and emphasize it every week that this is really important rather than just something that we do at the beginning uh, of, the, of the year. Um, you mentioned about uh, veterans. Uh, we, we attract a great number of veterans to our law school, um, and partly because of where we're located, but it's always been a, it's, it's been that way for a very long time, uh, and partly because of that, we've established a, a veterans benefits clinic, and our students have a, many of these cases that these veterans have before the VA uh, involve uh, psychological trauma, uh, or um, and so our students become quite expert in working with these kinds of issues uh, and taking these matters before the VA. And so that's, there's, a, there's a nice piece there uh, with our students around the wellness of veterans. Um, so, um, so, that's, so this has been real central to us. I want to talk about just a few other things that we do. One, one issue in particular, I think one of the hardest times in law school is January of your first year because you get your grades. And what we find at Wayne and Mary is a high percentage of our students are getting the worst grades of their life. They're high flyers, they're used to you know, getting A's, and all of a sudden we curve, and as a result of the curve, half, the, half of our 1Ls are in the bottom half of the class. And so one of the things we've spent a long time talking about, and it's a time of depression, it's a time of, you could just feel the affect among the 1Ls after those first uh, semester grades. And I think for a lot of them, it's sort of like my career is over, you know, I'm used to getting A's and I've got a, a B minus average, what does this mean for me in my future? So we've really encouraged all of our 1L faculty to spend some time talking about that uh, and to talk about what do your grades mean and why do we grade you? And what's the impact of your grades? And what's the impact of your first semester grades? And we talk a lot about Grades kind of get you to the first job, but how you perform is what gets you into your career. So uh, that's something that we've really focused on, because again, I think that's, a, that's such an important issue. And if I can, I want to tell sort of a personal story about this. So it's in the, in the late to mid-90s, and I go to the annual law professor meeting. 
And there's an unusual session, and for, for the law deans here, they'll know this was unusual in the 1990s. It was on wellness. And so I go to this, so it's kind of interesting. You know, most of the sessions are about con law or, or property or whatever, but this is about wellness. And so I go, the state of Washington had done a survey of their lawyers, and they had come up with some shocking data that we all know about here, we've been talking about, is that the mental health of, of, of lawyers in the state of Washington was really bad compared to the general population. And so they threw up this data and said the average population, here's where they are in terms of anxiety, here's where lawyers are. Here's where the average population is with respect to depression. Here's where lawyers are. And they go through this, and I'm kind of, boy, this is really interesting. I've never heard any of this before. And then they say, um, uh, they, they get to this uh, category of um, interpersonal sensitivity. I've never heard that word before. So I raise my hand and I say, I know depression. I know these other things. I don't know what interpersonal sensitivity is. Can you tell me what interpersonal sensitivity is? And the speaker says, rough paraphrase, interpersonal sensitivity is when your value as a human being is a function of how you're doing compared to you, to another person. And I thought to myself, wow, I, that, it, it, it's, that's what we teach law students, is their value as a, as a law student is how well do they perform and how well do they perform against someone else because we curve them. So we're just in flooding law students with this kind of sensibility. So I came back to the law school. It was the January. The students had just gotten their grades. And I said, I want to talk to you. And I told them about this study. And I told them about interpersonal sensitivity. And I said, and I have to confess as a professor that we're teaching you interpersonal <laughs> sensitivity. And it's toxic. And what I want to say to you is your value as a human being does not depend on how you perform. And I want you to hear that. Your value as a human being goes much deeper than that. A week later, another group of students come to me and said, we heard about your talk. Talk to us. And for the last 25 years, I've had a group of students come to me every year and say, give us the talk. <coughs> Because we, we've heard about this, and we want to, we want to live in that place. Um, I do think this is an important issue. Uh, we do curve our students, but it's important that we talk about it. And so that's what I've encouraged our faculty to do, and that's what our faculty do, is we try to say to the students, okay, you didn't do so well. Is this the end of your legal career? No, it's not. So that's been an important move for us. Um, we focused a lot on alcohol. Uh, obviously, alcohol is a huge issue. We've already talked about that today. Um, we've, our SBA has taken hold of this and has put up more and more alcohol-free events. Uh, and we also do sort of more things as a community in the law school that don't involve alcohol. And one of our best, it's one of the best events I think we have for, for students, is the student faculty basketball game. <laughs> tons of students come, tons of students play, tons of faculty play. The students always win, um, but it's a great, you know, it's, it's, it's just sort of, it's a small thing, but it's one of a lot of events like that where there's sort of an engagement that's not around alcohol. There's no alcohol. It's not focused there. Um, I'll also, uh, one other thing that, that I'll mention is a number of our students do need psychological care. And we've made a judgment that, that we have a counseling center at Winn-Mary. A lot of our students do go over to the counseling center to, to receive uh, uh, treatment. Um, we've decided to have a psychologist in the building. And so we've hired a part-time psychologist who can see students. Because some students want to go across campus and be a little bit more anonymous away from the law school. And some would rather have the convenience of being there. So that's been a, I think that's been a good move for us. Um, I think I'll just stop at that point. We've got a lot of deans to speak. Yeah. You, you do have a member of William and Mary's varsity basketball team who's a law student. Uh, oh, does he play in that game? He no. That's an interesting question. We have every year we have people that played college basketball, and they have to be the referees. <laughs> okay. They're not they're not committed to play. <laughs> All right. Um, let me now go to uh, Dean Purdue, who also was uh, was on our committee. Um, I know a lot of students and faculty at University of Richmond by virtue of being in Richmond. And um, to say that she is beloved uh, may be an understatement. 
but she's also very much a member of the Richmond and Virginia legal community. Um, I don't think of you as an extrovert, but, I, but you go to so many events as an ambassador for the university, and, and it's noted and appreciated. She's also, you may not know this, she's the president of the American Association of Law Schools and a former vice president of Order of the Coif. Now, I know that smart people, unlike me, get to be members of Order of the Coif, but just think about what do, what do you do when the members of the Order of the Coif meet? You know? I don't know, but we can ask her that afterwards. <laughs> So, uh, so at University of Richmond, what, what it really stood out was your Balancing Act program, as well as the fact that you um, have actually had a, a faculty retreat dealing with student engagement and well-being, and you have a student um, um, chapter of Lawyers Helping Lawyers. So if you could just touch on those as part of your remarks. Th thank you. Um, right. Oh, you get a committee together for Order of the Coif, and it looks like any other committee. <laughs> um, so we've, we've done a, a set of things. We had, had a program that it was, was called um, Balancing Act. We've rebranded uh, slightly. It's now um, You Are Wellbeing. Um, we use the You Are uh, um, uh, nomenclature from time to time. But it's a series of programs. It's not unlike the Wellness Wednesday, um, but a set of programs on a range of topics, um, uh, nu nutrition, um, uh, sleep, um, stress management, um, also some programming on um, debt management, budgeting. Um, we, we worry a lot about the issue of debt. That's something that's, that's come up. Um, and um, we've come to understand that, that students don't understand the issues as well um, as we would like. We had done a survey um, as part of uh, Access Lex, which is a group that used to do loans, um, and, and a concerning number of our students don't even know the amount of their debt. It's just a really big number. Um, and th th our, our sense is that's actually not the best way to, uh, to deal with it. Um, so that's, a, that's another um, a piece of it. Um, so a, a set of programs um, to, to try and make issues of wellness um, on people's minds. Um, I'll, I'll add there's, there are a couple other programs that we've done um, in the kind of not-for-credit programming area. Um, one of my colleagues um, and our uh, dean of students, who's, who's here, do a program called um, Just Practice, which is basically a mindfulness program. It's once a week. Um, we've just started it this um, semester. And, and when we started it, we actually targeted um, first-generation students. Um, one of the issues of, of uh, that that I worry about with respect to um, stress is uh, students who, who simply experience law school as uh, completely different than the world they've known. Um, and so I've talked to some of our um, first generation students who come in and say, this just isn't, maybe I don't belong here. Grades are a piece of it, but it goes way beyond that. And so how do we, how do we create a culture in which students can find their place um, even if they seem not to conform to what they are hearing the profession looks like. Um, uh, if what you hear is, if you're going to be a lawyer in Virginia, you better um, only show up in, in uh, dark suits, and if you're a woman, you better wear a skirt. That's uh, jarring, shall we say, um, for uh, a number of our students. It may not be incorrect um, for some of our profession, but if that's what we hit people with and don't provide a, a way of people processing that, um, it leaves students feeling quite alienated from the profession that they're going into. So th those kinds of issues are things we worry about um, a lot. Just practice is a, is a mindfulness, but it is a way of provides a forum for students to begin to address some of those um, concerns. I will say, as to that issue, I mean, one of the things I've, I've become more attentive to is what one of my colleagues calls the hidden curriculum. 
It, it, there are all kinds of things we tell our students that we don't realize we're telling them. Um, so the sense of, of uh, uh, um, interpersonal competition. If you say, to, if you were to ask our faculty, are you telling students they should be competing with each other? The faculty would all go, oh, I never, I never say that. On the contrary, I would say different things. And yet that's the message students frequently hear. They, they are seeing it in what we do, if not what we say. Um, and so uh, that, in some ways, is the hardest piece to get a handle on, of, of what are the, what's the hidden curriculum of, of the messages that we're sending. Um, just to, to, two other um, uh, brief notes. The, um, the, the, those were sort of programs not for credit. We, I, we have a small course for credit. Um, that uh, that I co-teach with one of my colleagues called the Happy Lawyer. Um, so the Happy Lawyer uh, meets um, uh, over dinner at my house, um, and uh, Chief Justice Lemons has agreed to join us at our next session. Um, and we have a series of readings. Um, the readings are um, some on some of the literature about some of the um, psychological and philosophical literature about happiness. Um, some on um, uh, purpose and finding purpose. I think w w I would say a major focus of that course is pushing students to think hard about purpose. The, the literature on satisfaction, the uh, uh, um, purpose, mastery, and control, those are kind of the three things that allow you to, f to, to thrive and be successful. Um, purpose is a big one, and if you lose track of that along the way, it can be um, uh, a, a challenge. Control is its own challenge for young associates, but um, for people un coming to understand, they can choose to exercise control. So, in some of the same ways we heard this morning, um, you can, or earlier today, you can choose to control um, when you're going to check your email. There are aspects of control that you can you can certainly. Um, Exercise. So uh, it, it's a it's a um, small um, part of what we do, um, but I think it um, helps as well. We've also decided we need counselors on site and um, are uh, are moving in that direction. One final observation: um, Gallup does a survey uh, that they've done for some years of, of um, uh, measuring for for college graduates and then also for law law graduates. Uh, the extent to which people are thriving um, after uh, after graduation, and they measure it across thriving, not only um, uh, socially and in your career, physically, financially, uh, so across about five different metrics. One of the big um, uh, component that what their data show is that what um, what correlates with with loss lawyers thriving is I had a professor who cared about me as a person. Um, that's a big one. Um, and so uh, what do we do? Well, we, uh, I think we, we have a faculty who, who believe that, um, but, but reinforcing that is actually not fluff, not an add-on, it actually making it understand that as part of what we do um, as a faculty and as a law school. I'll stop there. Thank you. So the next person I'll ask to speak is Dean Brent Helwig from uh, Washington and Lee, uh, who I didn't know before our committee was appointed. He's a tax expert, has an LLM in taxation from NYU, where you actually were an instructor afterwards prior to, prior to your various faculty appointments, um, which probably explains why I didn't know him, because I know nothing about, about tax. But a, a, a member of his faculty spoke extraordinarily highly about him, and when the Chief Justice um, uh, told me uh, that as a faculty member at Washington and Lee, he was so impressed with his dean, we had no choice but to, uh, uh, and it was a great choice to make. Um, what really struck me was the number of offerings and the, the richness of the offerings that Washington and Lee already has in the wellness area. Let me just... Uh, and you can take any, any several of them to talk about, but they, they do a faculty workshop. Um, they have peer mentoring, and peer mentoring, I think, is something I'd love to, to, to hear your talk on. There's an, a student bar association standing committee on wellness. There is the Washingtonian Society. 
that has a depression and anxiety support group and also a wellness fair at the ABA Mental Health Day on campus. So take any one of those, or any several of those, but it really just stood out. What you're already doing is so impressive. Sure, thank you very much, Justice Mins. And I should say um, at the outset, all the our programming that we have at Washington and Lee around wellness, um, which is similar to some of the um, programs that you've already heard from my colleagues, uh, I should, all the credit for that goes to my colleague, um, Trinae Mason, who is our Dean of Students and does is just does a phenomenal job. And um, sometimes I feel like I should give my space to her up here. But, but I'll talk about a, a few of those items. Um, the first one is that, that I think is worth highlighting and I'm really proud of the program that we have in place at Washington Lee is our system of, of peer or student mentors. Uh, we call them Courageous Fellows after a beloved professor and, and dean. And what that is, it's, uh, it's, it's we have our 1L sections broken down into small set, small writing sections of about typically around 20 students. And each of those writing sections has two Courageous Fellows who are assigned to those um, to that section. And they're, of course, they're right there um, at orientation, helping this, those students work through all the, the or kind of help navigate that, um, the orientation gauntlet, um, which, as Dave, as you mentioned, that can be daunting. You got to really worry about how much is retained from that. But we've got those, that's where they get introduced to the students, and they're there uh, throughout the first year, uh, that critical first year. And it's somebody um, that is, ex is easily accessible. If, a, if students are having issues, if they're, um, you know, whatever comes up, whatever pressure points those students face, we'd like to think that our faculty are available and accessible, and I think we are, but it's often a whole lot easier to go to a, a student colleague, and it's a whole lot easier to do that when you've got somebody that's really already assigned for that purpose and has already gotten to know you. And that's, uh, one, that's one aspect of our law school. I think really does affect the overall environment of the student body in a very positive way. So that's, um, and students apply to be Curtis Fellows. It's, it's kind of an honor. And, uh, and so I'm really, um, you know, there's a lot of fantastic students that devote a significant amount of time to that endeavor. That, that's gone remarkably well. Um, Justice Pence, you mentioned uh, that we have a standing committee on wellness that's actually was instituted by, us, by our student bar association. So this is kind of the students leading that they want more programming around wellness. And there was a, uh, the, that student um, committee this year uh, uh, constituted a panel presentation that involved a number of my faculty colleagues, but it was on at least the portion of it that I was able to catch was really focusing on what do you do with the intense focus on grades um, in certainly in the first year of law school, but in law school more general. And so this is really a panel presentation, um, Dave, that might have hit something around, you know, on something similar to the talk that you give. And it was, you know, sometimes you have these events and you, you have the best of intentions, particularly when it's the administration or faculty that's um, organizing that programming and, and you you want everybody to come and then you look around and you've got maybe 10 or 15 students and you wish you could reach more but the, when this one when it was organized by the students it was in our moot court room largest room that we have in the law school and it was packed to the gills and it was we had um, some of my colleagues actually one of my um, uh, more junior colleagues on the faculty who had graduated in the class of 2011 was speaking and just to really just to try our best um, to inject some measure of perspective um, uh, just to try to afford them um, that benefit. And I guess that's one, of the, you know, if, thinking about wellness and what we can do as administrators and faculty members, if there's really, well, I guess one thing that I, that I could impart that I think we could impart to students, it's that, it's perspective. And it, on the first day of orientation, when I, entered, when I welcomed the students to our law school, one of the things I tried to mention in that opening talk, I asked all of them to go home that evening, and all of my uh, incoming students to go home that evening and actually write down in a sentence or two, why is it that they are you know, at their first day of law school? What is it that led them to want to pursue um, a profession in the, in the um, 
in law? Why is it that they want to you know, be an attorney? Why are they there? What, is their, you know, what are they passionate about that they're willing to spend the next three years of their life and a significant amount of money pursuing? And I, I ask them to do that because I, and I recommend that from time to time they go back and look at it. I make a joke. I, I do want them to write it down. I make some joke about, you know, you don't have to have it tattooed on your arm, but that actually might not be a bad idea either, right? But no, but to date, nobody's taken me up on that. But, um, and I don't, actually, I don't know how many people actually do go home and write it down. That might be the first homework assignment that gets skipped in law school, right? <laughs> uh, but I have had students say that they did do it, and they were able to revisit that um, you know, right around this very difficult time right now in their 1L year when grades have come back and, 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 and people are getting news that they never thought they would receive in terms of their relative performance among a, a group of very bright people, right? And I, th I think that is, that is helped along the way. Students, to the extent that we can do, find ways to inject perspective, help students find their own perspective. I think that it goes a long way to promoting wellness. Heck, that's perspective. I wish I could give, give that to my own kids. I could wish I could give it to my colleagues. I wish I had more of it, right? If we're thinking about what makes any of us, um, you know, happier, I think if you can, if, if there's a lot of stress and you kind of, you get in this vortex and you think that this is the only thing that matters, I think for all of us, if we can step back sometime and realize the, the bigger picture that we're a part of, that, that brings a good level, a, a decent level of satisfaction. Another thing that I wish um, that I'll just throw out there since we're, we're talking about the ways that we might improve wellness in law school. I don't have, this is not anything that we're doing. This is something that I just think that I wish we could tackle in, uh, in the years ahead is a, a greater focus on teamwork in law school. And law school can be a very solitary endeavor. You're taking your own exams, you're getting your own grades. There's ways that we chip away at that through some student competitions. But it, I think it's rare in the practice of law that you do the, even the vast majority of your work in isolation. Usually you're a part of a team. Um, you know, when you hear back from employers, when they, when they, the feedback that we get is law schools about different skills and attributes that, uh, that employers are looking for in law students, there's any number of things that they mention, initiative, resilience, um, you know, the ability to work as part of a team, um, showing up on time actually shows up uh, a good bit, right? <clears throat> Sometimes I think we need that we need to do more as educators to find ways to build in actually team performance as opposed to individual performance in law school. And that uh, there's a lot of things that have not changed in law school over the years. The focus on individual performance, particularly in usually some sort of three-hour exam, continues to dominate. And I think that if I were to, you know, in self-reflection, that's something that law schools need to see if there's other ways that we can um, provide evaluations of our students um, for the benefit of employers. And hopefully, um, you know, employers at some point will kind of break out of their, um, you know, kind of path of least resistance in terms of how they go about selecting students for interviews. They say that, that there's these, all these soft skills that they're looking for, but yet they still, it, I, I've seen this, and I don't I really don't think I'm going out on a limb here, that there's still a heavy focus on grades and law review, and, and hope those, all those other soft skills kind of come along with it. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So that's the, those, if I'm thinking about ways that law schools in general um, can promote student wellness, it's really those two things. Thinking about ways that we can offer perspective to our students, and also starting to change uh, you know, it, the way we offer our program to see if there aren't ways that we can in, uh, involve uh, more teamwork among students as opposed to an, I, having such an emphasis on an individual experience. Thank, thank you very much. So now we're going to jump to the great Southwest, right, Elizabeth? So, uh, so I'm going to introduce Sandy McLaughlin by telling a very brief story about one of my clerk candidates, a, a double who, uh, from Southwest Virginia, from Tazewell. And when she was interviewing, um, I asked her the question that I ask every one of my clerk candidates, what do you see yourself doing 10 years from now? 
and she said she was heading back to Southwest Virginia because she had promised Magistrate Judge Sargent and Judge Jones that she would do so. And uh, that's the story of Sandy McLaughlin, who, um, who went to UVA and then University of Richmond and went back to her hometown of Grundy. My football coach was from Grundy. I came to love Grundy um, many, many years ago. And by the way, there's old Grundy and new Grundy, or lower Grundy and upper Grundy. Uh, and if, you don't, if you're not familiar with that, ask Sandy about that afterwards. Sandy has actually also been the vice mayor of Grundy. So she has served uh, the public in many ways. She is a family law expert and uh, the Appalachian School of Law program that really caught my eye was the ambassadors, the, the student mentors. And, uh, and so if you just uh, talk about that as part of your presentation, Sandy. Thank you. Okay, well at the Appalachian School of Law, um, our well-being initiative basically has two goals. One of which is to detect disorders and try to deal with those, and secondly, um, to put in place preventive measures as well. So a couple years ago, we started our ASL Ambassador Program, and these are students who are selected by faculty committee. Uh, obviously, they're at, usually at the top of the class. They have very personal skills. And um, we have started now training those ambassadors. Jim Leffler was very in uh, instrumental in that this past fall uh, before this semester started they were actually trained um, on how to detect uh, mental health substance abuse issues how to exercise confidentiality and when those problems actually need to be brought to the administration's attention so these ambassadors, um, we divide the new 1L students into groups and um, ambassadors will take a, a small number of 1L students and they will have weekly meetings um, with the ambassadors. Of course, it's an, uh, entirely voluntary. They don't have to do it. But these mentors act as not only uh, social mentors, maybe somewhat academic mentors, but also uh, mentors as well as where well-being is concerned as well. And that program seems to be working very, very well at this point. Um, so as Justice Mims mentioned, uh, our school is in Grundy, Virginia. Anybody here been to Grundy? Okay, a good number of you then. Well, you know, it's a, it's a five-hour drive from here in Charlottesville. It's down in a very rural part of the state a very beautiful part of the state, and we kind of pride ourselves in being a law school in a location where you can hear yourself think. Uh, <laughs> but obviously along with that comes challenges. Um, there aren't a lot of obvious um, outlets of things to do. So in that regard, a few years ago, we started our happiness project. Um, and the mission of the happiness project is to support uh, a mentally and physically healthy community by offering classes on nutrition, mental health related topics, stress management, yoga, Zumba, uh, other fitness practices. Um, so every semester we actually have, um, we offer sessions in all these things. For instance, uh, we have a holistic nutritionist come to our campus, offer a session on how to eat healthier. and. Uh, she will actually talk to them about the science behind how that helps stress. And you know, a lot of people think, well, if you're going to eat healthy, that's going to cost more money. And you know, she gives them training in how to eat healthy and it not be a more expensive, expensive way um, of eating. Uh, we also offer regular yoga, restorative yoga classes on campus free of charge to our students. We have a local instructor who comes down and, and does that service for free. Uh, we also have uh, stress management sessions that are offered uh, by a local registered nurse who has training in stress management. Those are offered um, frequently at, there again, no charge to the students. Um, also, because we are in such a beautiful part of the state, um, well, this is a beautiful part too, but, um, you know, we're beautiful, I guess, in, in a different way, but there are lots and lots of hiking opportunities, mountain biking, whitewater rafting, and some, some of our staff and faculty will take it upon themselves to schedule hikes with the students, and um, believe it or not, I've done that myself. Um, of course, 
we try to schedule these hikes so that they're uh, not of any particular level of expertise or, or level of, um, uh, you know, people who can do anything can, t can take these hikes. And that's a great opportunity for students to get out in nature, get away from the stress, but also bond with their fellow classmates and uh, faculty members as well. Um, some students, you know, not everybody likes to go on hikes. Not everybody likes to be outdoors. So our happiness project also has other components. Um, the uh, Christian Legal Society has regular Bible study sessions. Some students relieve their stress by getting together and have Bible study together. Um, we also have Odd Thursdays movie nights. On every Odd Thursday, um, a professor will uh, take charge of uh, showing a movie on campus. It's there again, it's alcohol free because we do encourage uh, events when possible to be alcohol free on campus. Students will watch the movie and then discuss it. And there again, bond with each other and also with the professor. Um, some students don't like movies, some students don't like hikes, so there's an Appalachian Knitting Club, and these students will meet periodically, sit in the lounge together and knit and make blankets uh, for the kids who are part of the CASA uh, program. So these are just a few of the um, examples of what we do on our happiness project to try to not only uh, get our students to bond together, but also bond with the faculty and staff. Therefore, it's easier to detect when there are problems that come up and we can help with those po uh, problems. Also, at the Appalachian School of Law, we have what we call an open door policy, which is when a professor is on campus, unless there's an urgency to prepare for class, that professor um, is to have their door open. And I think students find that very, very helpful. So many of them have told me, you know, I went, went to college and never even uh, knew where my faculty, uh, where their offices were. But we're always open to talk to students, not only about academics and courses, but about, you know, who won the ball game last night and where you need to go to the dentist, where you need to go to take your dog to the vet. So we have a very, collegial atmosphere. They are very supportive um, atmosphere, I think. Um, one thing that we did several years ago, which kind of goes along with grades and stress, um, we eliminated the traditional grading system for our 1Ls. Um, so they are no longer graded A, B, C, D. They're graded in another uh, method where they don't leave the first semester with bad grades thinking, how am I going to pull myself out of this? But, so they're not actually graded by the traditional graded method until their uh, third semester of law school. Uh, so that seems to help tremendously uh, with the competition felt in that first semester and first year with regard to grades. It gives students an opportunity to be able to um, get their feet wet, so to speak, and learn how to study the law before they're actually given um, traditional grades. Um, so that we can all take all the administration, the faculty, the other students take responsibility uh, for being sure that everybody um, is in a good state at our law school. Um, one thing that we have started doing is we have mandatory training before the fall semester begins for all of our faculty and our staff. staff. And during that mandatory training, one session that we had this fall was uh, titled Recognizing Students in Distress. And there again, Jim Leffler came down and did a wonderful presentation uh, to help our faculty and staff um, understand how to detect students who are in trouble, um, how to have conversations with them, uh, when and what they need to report to the administration, and also educated them on um, elements of confidentiality. So hopefully this will now open the door so that our faculty will have a much better understanding as to what role they need to be, uh, what role they need to play and be involved in this process as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Dean Galyabov, if, if you could go next. Uh, we've already um, heard her very impressive introduction. I would point out um, one additional fact. Uh, Dean Galyabov has a dual appointment at UVA. She's also a professor of history. 
uh, which I thought was pretty pretty impressive. And uh, additionally, um, in uh, in Charlottesville, uh, where there was such a, a terrible tragedy two years ago, she has been very much um, a uh, a part of the solution, a force for good, both behind the scenes and also um, and also in the public forum. So uh, I think on behalf of all of us, thank you for, for what you've done in that regard. What I would ask about UVA is this. Um, 35 years ago, when I graduated from law school, UVA had a reputation as being very hard, very pressurized. Throughout the university community, a lot of alcohol. Um, also great loyalty amongst the students. Now, in the past few years, having, again, watched UVA closely, a lot of that remains in terms of how loyal and how hard and, and a fair amount of pressure, much less alcohol. And I'm wondering, um, is during your tenure, has there been a, throughout your faculty tenure, has there been a focus on moving away from that? And, and how? And, and what have the results been? Thank you. Uh, so I, I want to first say it's, it's wonderful to hear what all the other schools are doing. And I think this is going to be so productive for all of us going forward. And there are clear synergies. And, and there are also some differences. But there's a lot that we're doing in common. But I feel like I'm learning a ton. So thank you to all of you. And I also want to give a shout out to my student affairs folks, Dean Sarah Davies and Kate Duvall, who are both here and were instrumental in making today happen. So thank you to them. Um, so I can't take credit for that shift, uh, Justice Mims. Uh, it preceded me. I was a member of the faculty. I've been here since 2002, um, but I was not a part of that. And But I would say you are accurate in identifying that alcohol has become uh, a much smaller part of the social life and uh, that we emphasize and encourage um, uh, student uh, activities and faculty activities that don't have uh, alcohol uh, uh, as much as they, they would have uh, several decades ago. Um, I think that, that uh, and, and I hope that I don't sound Pollyanna in this, but I, I do think we have retained the positive aspects of that culture that, that created all that loyalty. Um, and, and I think we've actually jettisoned a lot of the negative aspects of that. So, um, I think that we are still a place where people strive to be their best selves and uh, and to be the best and to excel and succeed. Um, and I think we do so in a way that emphasizes really each person's best self and not cutthroat competition, not the interpersonal sensitivity. And obviously it's there because there's a curve. And um, But I, I think we take every opportunity we can uh, to emphasize that we should be working as teams, that the relationships that we make here are key both to our students' success while they're here, uh, and also to their success as lawyers, to their happiness while they're here, to their happiness uh, once they go out into the world. And I think we, we really do emphasize the human element of this place. And the words that I think describe our culture, um, which are, is the, the baseline for, we have lots of programs, and I might talk about a couple of those, but I think our culture is really the baseline of our wellness programming. And to me, the, the key uh, attributes of that culture are, are humanity and our joy. Um, and I, I think we really take, take every student who comes as a whole person, and we want them to come here, and we want them to feel a sense of belonging and entitlement to be here and ownership over this place. Um, and we want them to, to, to bring their whole person here. So you were talking about being a veteran, being a first-generation student, right? Every student should feel equally uh, 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 a sense of belonging for who they are and their, and their whole self, um, and that we should be joyous together, and we should uh, go outside across the street and, and play softball if that brings us joy or go to movie night if that brings us joy or knitting or whatever it is, um, but that we do it together and that we're really one community. And I think um, the the piece of, you know, you can talk about less alcohol uh, and I think you can talk somewhat about less pressure, but I think the key part is what, what there's more of. And I think as we um, become aware, and I, I talk to alumni all the time, so I know these continuities, I see them because when I describe 
what we're doing at the law school today, it's very much what was done, you know, 20, 30 years ago in certain respects that people recognize. Um, but we don't take it for granted. So I think we put into place all kinds of structures. And we have things very similar to the ambassadors and, uh, and the peer mentors. We have um, both peer mentors who are second and third years assigned to every first year small section. Uh, we have a newish program in the third year uh, um, uh, uh, coming up where um, we have community fellows who are first year students who we bring before the, they even start and we train them in a lot of the same things that we've been talking about and then we put three of them in every small section so and there are some in the room today uh, uh, and they're in the small sections of 30 to be an eye and, and be uh, 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 um, a point of contact for everybody and to make sure that people are thriving and to identify people who are not and to be on top of the, the social dynamics dynamics uh, and, and the wellness. And so um, I think we, we, we take our culture, our historical culture, seriously in a, in a positive way that we see as requiring institutional commitments and institutional support um, uh, that goes beyond no alcohol and goes to uh, how do we support you, how do we make sure you all feel uh, that you're creating good relationships with one another. Um, I think the students themselves, and this has come out in a lot of what the other deans have said too, the students themselves are a huge part of that. And um, we have a very robust student government culture, uh, student self-government culture, and student organizations. And our Student Bar Association also has done wellness programming. Many of our student organizations have peer mentorships. Uh, we have a Student Bar Association program of Take Your Professor to Lunch, uh, where the students take their professors to lunch, and the Student Bar Association pays for the professor. Um, and, I, and it's less about the money, because I think, at least for me, most of the time the student the faculty ends up paying anyway um, for all the students. It's not about the money, it's about the expectation that there's a program, the expectation that the students are going to invite the faculty to lunch and the expectation on the faculty's part that the faculty are going to say yes. Um, and so those relationships, I think, are really fostered. Um, we have a, a program called Seminars and Ethical Values where we uh, host uh, 12 faculty, one or two faculty members host 12 third year students in their homes, uh, usually over dinner. Um, um, and it's on a subject outside of the regular curriculum. It, when Wendy was talking, it, it reminded me of, of our seminars and ethical values. Uh, my husband, who's also a professor here, he and I have co-taught one almost every year for 17 years on work-life balance. Uh, but people teach them on all kinds of ethical and moral and wellness uh, uh, issues. So that creates a real opportunity for the kind of investment in students that I think is so important. I've read those studies, too, and I think they're really right. Um, uh, I would say um, we have, I mean, there's so much more to say. I, I'm going to stop talking in one second. Um, uh, I have several pages of notes that, that I won't use. Um, but I, I would say um, that we, we have an open door policy as well, not a, a written policy, but our faculty very much have the ethos of being in the building and being available. And I would say um, our staff really do as well. Um, so our students understand that the people in student affairs and in admission and in uh, career, uh, career services and um, uh, financial aid, they are all there for our students. And it is their goal to help our students thrive. And our students know that. Um, and there really is a retail level support system uh, that, uh, that our staff is, is involved in and that our faculty is often involved in. Um, the last two things I'll say, um, we too started out with university counseling services, and then we went to a half-time counselor here. We now have a full-time counselor here. Um, and uh, on the one hand, you could say, I wish we didn't need a full-time counselor. And on the other hand, I'm glad that uh, our students are coming forward, and I'm glad that we have the capacity to, um, to serve them. Uh, one of the other things that we do, and I'll close here, um, specifically on mental health services, is um, we have a fund, which uh, it was created by an alum who's, uh, who had a relative who was also an alum who tragically committed suicide. And he said, you know, what is it that we could do more and how could we help? And he gave um, uh, resources for a fund for uh, paying co-payments for mental health services for students in need. So, you know, the, the, the psychological services that we provide in the law school are not meant to be weekly therapy sessions. Uh, uh, we don't have the capacity 
capacity to do that, and so our students turn to providers in the community, but there are often co-pays, and, uh, and so this is a fund to pay specifically for that. Um, so I do think overall, you, you, you know, as other people have said, you want to address it at the level of culture, student culture, student faculty culture, um, student organizations, curricular programs, uh, 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 staff programming, student support programming, and then obviously at the specific level of mental health needs uh, uh, when you get to that point, but you hope that you can create the circumstances under which everybody thrives and they don't need those services, but you want to provide them when they do. Thank, thank you very much. Um, you know, I've, as I've heard now, three of the deans talk about having um, counselors on campus or in the building. Um, our report just uh, just this last year pointed out that uh, that to some extent that that can be a sensitive thing, and that some schools might want to have counselors offsite. Um, and uh, the fact that that at least three of you now have on-site counselors. I hope is indicative of perhaps a lessening of the stigma uh, of, uh, of of behavioral health issues and um, and and more ability to talk about it and to deal with it um, in a in a community setting. So uh, so I'm, I'm actually encouraged by that. So we go from one of Virginia's <coughs> oldest law schools down Route 29 to Virginia's newest law school, uh, Keith Faulkner at um, Liberty. And you are a builder. Uh, I guess in, in, you, you, get, you, you have the advantage that in many ways you're, you're writing on a, uh, a blank slate because, because of the newness. But when I look at all the things that you have started, I'm excited to hear you know, the, how it specifically relates to wellness. What you may not know about Dean Faulkner is that he actually has operated a nuclear plant on a U.S. Navy ship, and then he has instructed others how to do so. Um, Justice Kelsey wrote a um, lengthy and complex opinion about nuclear plants, and uh, perhaps we need to um, uh, have you um, uh, give us a, an amicus brief next time. Uh, uh, next time that comes up, I would point out it was a unanimous opinion, um, and uh, um, but uh, but yeah, it's um, we look forward to hearing not about nuclear plants, but about your students. Great. Well, thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here, uh, Chief, and, um, and everyone who's here. We appreciate it. I'm particularly thankful for my six students who are here, who traveled up, uh, along with my brand new Associate Dean for Student Development, Colonel David Western, uh, after he joined us after having served 25 years in the Air Force. So uh, we're thrilled about David's uh, arrival. Uh, an interesting thing that we've done uh, at Liberty is, as we have uh, really started thinking about wellness. Being a new law school, there are a lot of things you just simply have to do first, like get ABA accreditation, maintain ABA accreditation, and the like, which we've done. But as you get to build out uh, on that theme of building, uh, it's an exciting uh, opportunity for us. So Colonel Western brings a, a very uh, good spirit of mentorship. But we've also hired a new director of student life who is a life coach. Uh, and uh, that is her background. She has a master's degree in life coaching. So, uh, so we're excited. She's only been with us for about uh, six months or so. So, so Miss Laura Slagle is her name. So that's that's been great. I don't want to duplicate all of the things that that I've heard here. And um, I do want to take a point of privilege for a moment and thank Dean Purdue for her great leadership of AALS this year. That's that's a monumental task and uh, something that should not be. Uh, overlooked and not appreciated. But some of the things that we're doing, I think, that are a little different and are consistent with uh, not only a law school, but certainly a law school uh, based uh, in a community of faith, is we have um, instituted a uh, peer mentoring uh, group, but it's uh, essentially a prayer mentor group. So we have a one-to-one -one relationship. So our two L's and three L's each year uh, come together uh, large portions of them, and they reach out to our incoming 1Ls. So before our 1Ls ever reach uh, the law school, our uh, prayer mentors, peer mentors, have already reached out to them and provided them with a point of contact uh, so they know at least one human being electronically on day one. So, uh, so that has been something that the students have really um, I think clung to in recent. I see Miss Miss Watson shaking her head. So she, uh, you know, of course, every 
peer mentor has their, their pluses and minuses. Some are more engaged than others, but, but it's at least an anchor point for them to, to reach out to. Uh, some other things that we've done um, in recent, uh, in very recent uh, years since my arrival is uh, we have instituted uh, various activities surrounding wellness. Uh, for example, um, as recently as Sunday, we had a Super Bowl party. So what we're trying to do every month, at least one, times a mo- one time a month, we're trying to have fellowship outside of the normal area where you would think. Uh, some people may not think that's a wellness activity, but it, it certainly is. It's a community activity that builds uh, camaraderie. Uh, all of our activities at Liberty are sans alcohol. <laughs> So uh, it's really not a challenge for us. <laughs> so uh, so uh, that's, thank goodness that's one thing we don't have to worry about, uh, at least at school-sponsored uh, uh, functions. But uh, other things that we're doing uh, include, uh, we are starting, uh, Ms. Slagle is starting a, a three-week hands-on workshop series for our faculty and staff, and that will roll out this semester. And uh, we're going to be focused on providing a toolbox to increase resiliency uh, uh, or teach our faculty how to encourage resiliency within our student body, coping mechanisms for anxiety and stress. This is a real significant issue for me because I have a teenage daughter who suffers uh, from anxiety, significant anxiety. So it really, much like Lynn said, this is one of the things that, that it really hits home for me. And um, as be, has been mentioned, you know, the January session coming off Christmas break, uh, the high of Christmas break for students, is oftentimes a, a downer. And uh, we really spend a lot of time as a faculty and staff talking about how to come alongside these students and lift them up and encourage them and, and discuss their worth uh, and, and how it is not tied to a GPA but is much, much greater, uh, similar to other folks. But uh, we're also um, working very hard to, to develop our spiritual development uh, of our students. You know, a lot of students will have a faith uh, component in their life, and it may be very strong before they arrive at law school. And law school, as we all know, is the great bulldozer of all things that are good sometimes. So uh, we try to give them an opportunity through convocation. We have a weekly convocation where we bring in speakers who speak on a variety of topics. Sometimes they are, they're certainly faith-based. Sometimes they're, they're not faith-based, but there's certainly uh, a faith component. And again, that fellowship uh, time that comes along with that. Uh, since Colonel Western has arrived three months ago, uh, we've decided to start a faculty and staff Bible uh, worship and book series with our student body. So we have about 10 or 12, I think, of our faculty uh, and several of our staff that are joining in to some people will be leading a book study, some people will be leading a Bible study. Bosch Division, one of our fac- faculty members, is the grandson of Billy Graham, the late Billy Graham. And uh, Boz takes a group of students down to uh, the Graham compound in North Carolina annually and, and spends time with them uh, in a retreat, meditation, study of the Bible, and just, again, a time of fellowship. We have uh, other faculty members who are doing those things uh, along the way. So we're doing a lot. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up here because I know we're getting thin on time. But, but one of the things that I've had the most fun with is uh, two things that I've launched is uh, dinner with the dean. So I go out with a group of students. I see a lot of heads, a lot of free, free dinners in this group. Uh, so I take a group of um, nine students, three 1Ls, three 2Ls, and three 3Ls to dinner once a month. And we, our ground rules are there are no ground rules. You talk to me about whatever you want. I will not go back and report that to the faculty. But what I use that as is another outlet for students. A lot of times law students feel like they have no real person to talk to. They might feel that the SBA is not effective or they, they're uncomfortable talking to staff. So I simply uh, provide them that. Uh, and then the last is our, our better practice luncheon series. So I bring in, for example, tomorrow we have uh, uh, Judge Petty from the Virginia Court of Appeals coming in to talk to our students. This is focused on one else to set the table for professionalism and wellness often comes up in these conversations. Uh, so uh, bringing in some practitioners to talk to them about the, uh, and jurists to talk about the pressures that they're going to face as they make that transition into practice. So, Plenty more. But... Excellent. Thank you. So um, 
Now, um, I got a, an email from, uh, from Henry Butler this morning that he was suffering from a lack of wellness but, uh, <laughs> related to his throat and uh, cold or the flu, and that he will get over it very shortly. But, uh, but we lack nothing by having Victoria Huber here, who I've known for many years and uh, um, who really is um, uh, very, um, really helps to make the place go at George Mason at Scalia School of Law. Uh, she is a UVA law graduate, clerked for, um, on the Fourth Circuit, uh, but has been at George Mason since 1997. And uh, George Mason is fascinating because there are, there's a cohort that's a tr the traditional law student that comes shortly after college and goes through in three years and yet also a, a very different cohort that's, that's professional, uh, much later in their career, potentially part-time, and I'm wondering how, it's, how you deal with two very distinct groups of students in that regard. Uh, thank you, Justice Mims. Yes, I am not Henry Butler. Um, <laughs> but uh, I am here and, and working in part on uh, well-being uh, because of his energy uh, and focus to a lot of things at the law school um, that, that are beyond the traditional um, classes. Um, it came, this topic generally came to me in my bucket and how the law school is approaching it from professional development. That's my bailiwick. And I think you all collectively would be pleased to know if you attend any national event with um, law firm professional development people uh, or recruiters, what are the two most well-attended meetings of that day? One, diversity and inclusion, and the other on well-being. Uh, so the firms, the employers, the government agencies are out there grappling with this um, topic as well. And it came to me personally um, from the, the national um, report, and then, of course, uh, the good work that was done here. Uh, so for us, when we look at professional development, including well-being, uh, we have, um, I think Justin used this term earlier, he's not here, but we have buy-in from the dean, the professors, and staff, and students, and we have, as you pointed out, Justice, a range of students, uh, but you have to have good habits, whether that's professional development or good habits for well-being. And for us, it's uh, trying to make things uh, a part of the regular conversation, um, something that you do all of the time, again, whether that's professional development, in the baby sense, writing good thank you letters. Uh, all of our students are required to do self-assessments, having a higher EQ, and now well-being. So for us, when we uh, start with well-being, we have mandatory things and we have optional things. A lot of the optional things we do, many of the schools have already uh, spoken of, and I'm happy to say we do as well. Events, uh, non-alcoholic events, we have postings, we have meditation. Etc. But our mandatory things, um, really, it's, it's a big deal for us. Because we have such a wide range of students, rush hour for us is 4 o'clock on. Uh, they are out there working. Over 80% of our students, full and part-time, are working in the city or in Northern Virginia. And thus, they're fighting uh, traffic as well as balancing their lives. So if we just do optional things, we're losing a big part of the population. And as one of our professors says, we're signaling that somehow it's less important. And for us, well-being is very important. So if you signal, uh, in, a, in a law school setting, you're signaling importance by giving credit uh, or by requiring certain things for uh, graduation. So we like to start with um, embedding some well-being into our classes. Our professional responsibility teachers cover well-being in different ways uh, in their classes. In our externship program, we have mandatory tutorials. One tutorial each semester is dedicated to well-being. Judge Capsalis came and spoke in the fall uh, on our last well-being topic. And for us, that's over 100 students per semester. That's a, almost a fifth of our population each semester is getting that. Uh, we also have some required things. They're not credit-bearing, but they're required for graduation. They're related to the bar and getting ready for the bar and understanding character and fitness, and we um, focus on well-being in those sessions as well. Two things, that, um, to, so we can move on and get questions. Two things I think I would focus on for Mason beyond our mandatory uh, elements are something we've done with our academic regulations uh, and our on-site counselor. Yes, we too now have an on-site counselor. Uh, she does not report to a law school uh, hierarchy. She reports to our 
central um, counseling services. She's only part-time at this point, but the majority of her patients or her clients are indeed law students. Uh, they are the largest population on the Arlington campus. Uh, and two things that I think might be helpful for this group to hear that we do with them. One, she meets regularly with me or members of my staff to find out what's going on with the law students or to set up separate events. Related to that, we now have specific group therapy discussions on Arlington for law students. Um, the topics, we work closely with the students who are invested in this topic on what to cover. For us, the, the mothership, the main campus is out in Fairfax. That's a long way away. So having group therapy discussions in Arlington is a big help for us, and having a counselor on site in Arlington has been a big help for us. The second thing I want to flag for this group is our academic regulations. Anna Maria Nields is here with me as well, and she's uh, been very involved in this. Several years ago, um, after seeing students challenging, uh, having challenges in different ways, we added to our academic regulations things that help us I'm going to say this in a way that maybe sounds worse than it is, catch them sooner. Uh, find out who those students are that are having problems sooner. We discovered that you know, a student that might be having a problem somehow gets reprieves in different classes from different professors for late papers, or gets a pass on attendance or fails one class or withdraws from another class. The academic regulations we now have in place help us catch those centrally so that those students don't slip through the cracks. Uh, we have exclusion points, which you earn by having withdrawals or poor grades or attendance issues, and you're required to come in and see one of us when these happen, and there are certain things that go along with that, as well as a policy that takes the burden of, uh, out of the professor's hands when a student says, gosh, I've been sick, I'd like to turn in this paper late, or worse, doesn't even ask for that permission and turns in the paper 10 days late. Um, now, again, professors, that's out of their hands. The stu uh, professors don't have to make those tough calls um, or feel badly for one student. It's sent to a sort of central wing, if you will, and for us, that's been really effective. We've caught students much sooner in the pipeline uh, than we might have otherwise done. Uh, and we're having really uh, effective um, results getting those students to get help um, or addressing what is it that's making them chronically late or seek withdrawals or need exceptions um, and exemptions. Um, so I really encourage a Regulation, regulation approach to it as well. Uh, if there's a way to, to get students that maybe don't want to get help just yet, um, but they do if they start talking to you. I think I'll leave it with that. Thank, thank you very much. And thank you for mentioning attendance. I, um, uh, that was one of the major aspects of the report, was how important an attendance policy is. And traditionally, we thought of attendance as being essentially discipline and, and focus. And really, it's, it's, it's actually the early warning signal of some sort of a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and I appreciate very much how, how George Mason deals with that. Our final presenter is Douglas Cook, the interim dean at Regent, who's been on the faculty since 1987, the year after the school began. Um, I noted that one of his um, articles is on the life and legacy, legacy of Blackstone. And, and that caught my eye, but it caught my eye only, it definitely caught my eye, but then afterwards I noticed the next article, which is one that I definitely want to read. It's entitled, How I Spent My Sabbatical, or What Happens When a Torts Professor is a Juror in a Negligence Case. <laughs> <laughs> Now, we don't have the time during your presentation, but I want to know about, about um, strikes uh, within that particular case when we're offline. Yes. Um, but uh, I do appreciate very much uh, the Regent um, uh, listed several things that you're doing in our report, uh, including, in particular, you have an emergency preparedness committee, and just like um, at um, Appalachian, a center for student happiness. Mm -hmm. And I was curious about both of those. Yes. Thank you very much. I love that term, student happiness. Uh, when we first rolled that out at Regent, it's a university-wide uh, center at, uh, at the university. Um, I remember stumbling over it, uh, student happiness, but, but it has grown on me. And, uh, and I think it captures um, some, some important things. Uh, like many of the schools represented here, uh, we do a lot of programming on student wellness. 
uh, in our required 1L orientation, which there's a fall version of and then also a spring version of. Uh, we discuss issues of student well-being. Um, we have the ubiquitous Jim Leffler come down uh, every semester and speak to students in our professional responsibility class about issues of mental health and substance abuse and so forth. We have um, uh, lawyers helping lawyers meetings uh, on our campus in the law school for both law students and community attorneys. So an opportunity for uh, both sides of that to come together and discuss those issues. Um, we did decide to embed issues of lawyer, law student well-being into our curriculum. We have a one credit uh, required 1L course called Foundations of Practice in which we discuss issues of law student well-being. Uh, we have students in that course go through um, psychological assessments through our Psychological Services Center, which operates in our university's uh, graduate school of psychology and counseling. The students receive feedback uh, on those psychological assessments. The primary point of the course is to, is to help students form their prof professional identity. Um, and uh, including all of these issues and more. As a part of that required course, we also assign each student in the course, so in other words, all of our, all of our first year students, uh, to a faculty mentor. And the students uh, each meet with their faculty mentor uh, during the course and discuss all of these issues, include, including law student well-being. So, so we're trying to be as intentional as we can. And, and perhaps if I could just take a moment and speak aspirationally, as uh, Dean Helwig indicated uh, a, a bit ago, um, I hope that our attention to law student well-being uh, does not fail to include the law school classroom. Uh, when I was a law student almost 40 years ago now, um, the law school classroom was a threatening place. It was a difficult place. Um, it could be at times um, humiliating and um, even demeaning. And sometimes my professors were just mean. <laughs> well, I should say they seemed to me that, no, I think they were just mean. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and I think that in terms of the stress and the pressure of the classroom, I think we've come a long way in the last 40 years. Um, I think that model has gotten better. I'm a little worried though, and I, and I want to give some attention to, to being intentional about that because many faculty members at our law schools today went to law school in an era when the law school classroom was different like that. And uh, um, Dean Perdue talked about the hidden curriculum. I want to make sure that we don't have a hidden curriculum that, that maybe is not as overtly stress producing as it once was. But my concern is that we not from the outset in the classroom, which is our common shared experience between students and faculty, that we not build a gap or a chasm between students and faculty because I think that faculty hold the key to working with students on issues of, of wellness and well-being. That's why I'm so encouraged by the open door policies. I know on my faculty I want to make sure that, that that calculus of, well, when I'm on campus, I have my door open and I'm available to students. Okay, how often are you on campus? That's the next question I want to ask, just to make sure because six required office hours a week is not enough for the kinds of conversations and the kind of interaction and the kind of mentoring and at, at Keats Law School at, at mine the opportunity to pray with students and, and really engage them on a significantly deep level. Um, that takes time and it takes faculty availability. So the culture of the classroom and the culture of student and faculty interaction I think may be um, important next places that we go in, in all of these issues. Thank you. Thank you. So now I'd like to actually to hear from the students. Um, we're approaching the 4.30 hour, maybe we're at the 4.30 hour, but Mr. Chief Justice, I don't see a red light in front of me, so I'm gonna <laughs> trespass on your time and Ray White's if I may. Go for it. 
Thank you. So, um, students, um, you may ask a question, make a comment, um, make a suggestion, whatever you want to do. But we would love to, uh, to get your thoughts, your feedback, um, because you're why we're here.